I'm just going to share my PowerPoint slides here. We get oh. that started. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Giselle, and I will be moder moderating today's webinar on success in industry careers led by our speaker, Athena Parker. Um, but before we begin, a few we have a few um, housekeeping items. So let's begin with our code of conduct. So in an effort to foster produ a productive and inclusive space, we do not tolerate harassment of any sort. Please see the complete code of conduct in this uh, link that I will post in the chat. Um, um, if you have any concerns, please send me a private chat. We do have a chat feature where you can post your thoughts or questions, and this will not be recorded, but our meetings will be recorded, and I'll reserve the last 10 minutes for questions and answer where it will not be recorded. So if you wanna wait till the end to ask your questions, you can do that as well. Um, we will now begin the presentation. So it is my pleasure to introduce Athena Parker. Athena is the Senior Director of Recruitment at Kelly Science and Clinical, focusing on connecting companies with exceptional scientific professionals. Athena use, uh, utilizes data-driven insight and heartfelt empathy to navigate the recruitment and talent acquisition landscape effectively. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Athena. And Athena, let us know if you want us to ask questions throughout or reserve um, them to the end. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to be here to talk about just modern day job ser searching and transitioning from academia to industry. Um, I do like um, uh, these presentations to be a little bit less formal, so a little bit more informal. So if you have questions, I'd love to, to answer any questions. You can feel free to put them in the chat. Feel free to come off, come on camera or not be on camera. It doesn't matter, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, and, and the content today that I'm gonna share is hopefully, I'm gonna share a little bit, sprinkle in a little bit of everything from the beginning of a job search all the way through um, to the end and kind of, and then also include some information about how you can use AI in your modern day job search for industry jobs. Um, but of course, I'd also love to hear questions about what, what you need. This is what I think is helpful and what I get asked a lot of questions on, but um, of course the landscape is always kind of uh, changing. Um, let's see. If I can make it to my next slide. Um, so just a little bit about me. So my name is Athena. Um, I am a Portland native. I went to Concordia University and I have a bachelor's degree in biology and exercise science. Um, and I've been working at Kelly um, for nine years now, specifically in talent acquisition. And I've helped companies hire anybody from entry level warehouse and light industrial manufacturing technicians all the way now in science to senior and director level scientific roles. Um, Kelly as a whole, we're a staffing agency. Um, so in uh, our scientific division is the second largest um, uh, uh, talent agency with scientific talent specifically. We partner with over a thousand companies in North America for their hiring needs. I pulled the statistics. So just as of yesterday, Kelly Science has placed 1,135 people in new jobs just in 2024. Um, so in the first six months of the year, and then all of our recruiters have some sort of scientific background, whether that be a bachelor's degree or higher. Some of our recruiters have PhDs, um, and they um, almost all of them will have some sort of industry um, expertise. Um, so we're really positioned well, not only to be good at hiring and finding people in talent, but also understanding what they actually do, what our companies um, that we hire for do. Um, and so we're really the, we call ourselves the experts at hiring experts. Um, so uh, something, a couple of things that I wanted to share in term, before we kind of get into job searching and some tips and tricks that everybody can, can utilize is just sharing some uh, employment data. And this is the kind of stuff that I get like really excited about or just I find to be really interesting. Um, we use a company called, the company that we use or get our data from is called Lightcast. Um, and the, the information that I pulled today is from April of 2024. So it's about a month old now, um, but uh, it's all specifically to the Portland metro region, um, which I find to, to be just really interesting, which I think where a lot of our um, members are coming from today. Um, so one of the things that uh, on this um, uh, infograph that I found really interesting is is taking a look at kind of where the average monthly job postings are. So the blue graphs are the job 
postings. And then the dark blue is the estimated hiring. So how many people were actually hired in those time periods. Um, and what we kind of see is that, you know, job postings certainly have monthly trends. Um, but in terms of comparing the current job market in 2024 with 23 and 22, we have less jobs in our market today but not super substantially any less jobs. The thing that I find super interesting when looking at something like this is just the amount of people that are being hired per the job postings. Um, so, you know, back uh, two years ago, probably had one job posting, you were hiring five to 10 people. Now you're looking at probably hiring one, maybe two people per job posting. Um, so everything that we're gonna talk about is kind of through the lens of like, what is gonna give us that additional leverage to be the one person that gets hired from the job postings that our companies are looking at. Um, and then also some other things to note, you know, the median day for a job posting for specifically in uh, science is going to be 34 days. So you have about one month where companies are looking for people and then they're moving forward with, with the process. So again, it's always going to be thinking about things and tips and tricks that you can leverage to help be one of those people that are getting hired, but also how to leverage like that 34 day um, time period where they're, where the job postings are gonna be live. Um, another, this is a little bit fuzzy, but another um, uh, just kind of uh, based on our uh, data company, the uh, top companies that hire kind of in our area. Obviously, I don't think that this should be a surprise to anybody that OHSU is the number one um, employer of scientific talent in um, uh, the Portland metro market. Um, these are also also kind of uh, highlight some of the top job titles that company use, use on job postings. So computational biologists and biologists um, tend to lean up high. Um, I would say that, you know, again, it's always interesting to learn where the data comes from because things like lab technicians or lab assistants, those are also always used very highly. Things like bio biologists, that's super interchangeable in terms of what those types of jobs can be. So, um, so just a, a little bit of insight in term, into um, our region. And then just looking at the job forecasting for the Portland metro region versus national. So Portland, uh, the Portland Metro is going to be that black line um, and then Nashville is going to be the blue line. So, again, probably not super um, uh, revolution. You know, this isn't going to reveal any super big secrets. The Portland uh, scientific job market is a little bit smaller than what we would see on a national level when we're comparing Portland to like a Boston or a San Francisco um, or even like a, a North Carolina. We're going to obviously be smaller, but the outcome in the forecast, kind of what their foggy crystal ball is showing, is that we're really not going to fall behind any national hiring. So we're going to still we're going to uh, have probably a little bit less um, job opportunities, but we're not we're still uh, pacing national average fairly closely with our size. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of what you know when we're thinking about it, how to find a job you know one of the things is obviously going to be networking i think that everybody on the call is probably taking the first step you're participating in a group women in science you've probably been to some of their uh in-person events um and uh, are participating today so some of the sometimes i think one of the hardest things is deciding well what what jobs are there? What can I do with my degree? Um, what companies are going to be hiring? There's a lot of like questions that come around there. And that's where leveraging your network. And I, I really don't love the term networking because I think that like while you're networking, you should also be building community and building, uh, uh, you know, almost like friendships with individuals, but certainly leveraging um, in-person connections, especially in a small in, uh, or in a small geographic region like Portland is going to be super helpful if you're looking to transition or move into an industry job. Um, so some of the things like networking in person, you're going to obviously break, build those long term uh, relationships um, and community. Um, so a couple of the regional groups that you may be interested in joining or have had participated in before. So there's obviously Women in Science Portland, big shout out. Um, then there's also Oregon Bio uh, Science Association that has a lot of events um, that are coming up. Um, there's also Life Science Washington. They're based more obviously in Washington in Seattle, but they have events uh, regionally as well. Um, and then there's also Women in Bio, which is another um, group that is national, but they also have local chapters for Seattle and the Bay Area. So you can join both nationally and regionally. 
Um, I think that, yeah, getting to know people and asking them about their career paths is always going to be a super unique way in terms of taking your job search, um, because I think that um, many of us probably even when we started our academic journey, we're going to do something completely different. I mean, maybe you're one of those lucky people that said, I'm going to I'm going to do this. And then you did it. Um, I know for me specifically, that was not what happened. Um, so sometimes just being able to meet people and talk to them and develop relationships and just understand their job search can be really big eye opener. It's going to help you learn what kind of jobs you can do, the things that are very obvious, you know, with your job search. Or maybe sometimes you're looking at jobs that are, um, you know, adjacent or maybe something that you've never thought of before. Um, another thing that looking at in terms of leveraging networking is going to be online tools. One of the biggest online tools for networking is going to be LinkedIn. Um, and what I really talk about when we're talking about LinkedIn, it's really making yourself findable to companies. So it's being able to help companies if they're looking for somebody with your skill set and you're like, I would like a job or maybe you just want to be open or you don't want to be open, but you'd still it's still really nice when somebody reaches out to you and says, hey, would you be interested in this job? Um, it's just building out your profile and making it a lot easier for companies to find you. So making sure that like all of your contact information is on there, that you have um, all of the skills, something similar to what you would have on a resume posted on your LinkedIn profile. Um, you can also have different options on your LinkedIn profile to indicate to companies that you're looking for jobs. Um, and then another way that you can leverage your LinkedIn um, profile is obviously building connections with people that have similar backgrounds, work at companies that you may be interested in. Um, a big thing for, especially coming out of academia, is networking or meeting other alumni from your program who may work at companies that you're very interested in. Um, reaching out, doing things things like an informational interview. So maybe it's somebody that you're very interested in. There's an, there's never going to be a downside to reaching out and asking somebody if they'd have coffee with you or, or meet with you just so you can understand a little bit more about their career journey and then also their um, jobs at their company. People love to talk about, especially if they love their job, they love to tell you about what they do uh, and what companies um, and how they kind of got there. Um, and then also responding to in-mails, I think one of the things that people don't know is that uh, if a company is uh, looking to recruit somebody, it'll indicate whether or not you're likely to respond to their messages. And companies pay to have the ability to, to send you messages. So if, if you're getting a lot of messages or if you're not responding or if you're not really active, it can be a flag that um, company companies can select if they are like, well, let's see who, who may be most likely to, to connect with us on um, LinkedIn. Uh, let's see, do any, oh, no questions in the chat. How are we doing? Does anybody have any questions so far? No? All right. Um, another thing I just kind of wanted to uh, highlight as well. So this is kind of the behind the scenes of LinkedIn. So if recruiters or other companies are utilizing this tool, this is probably going to be like one of the number one tools companies are utilizing to hire people. It's just, this is all of the advanced search features that companies can utilize. So different things that they can filter for. And some of the things that I, that I think people don't know that, that can, or the reason that you'd want to utilize your LinkedIn or build those network connections is that people can filter by their network relationships to you. So if they, if you have a mutual connection or if they're connected with you directly, um, and then also company followers. So when you're thinking about building in your LinkedIn network, like actually taking time to follow the companies, because that can be something if companies are looking for people, they want people who are interested in following up on their on their company information, and then also the keywords as well. And um, so I think sometimes when we think about building our LinkedIn profiles, we miss a lot of keywords um, or, or just miss, we put in our job titles, but we don't necessarily fill it out in terms of what we're doing in our roles. And that can be a place where um, we just fall short if people are trying to look and look and find us. Um, again, this is just a tool to make it easier for people to find you. It's And also you, you could probably do a whole masterclass on how to build a proper LinkedIn profile. This is just going to be high level to get people started or get to be thinking about the tools that you can utilize. Um, so another, so kind of thinking about, so we've kind of connected with our companies, we've made it easier for them to find us. Um, some tips on, you know, converting your resume to, uh, uh, converting a resume to be able to be useful for um, industry. 
Um, so the first thing that I find, especially from academia, is just understanding the difference between a CV and a resume because they're kind of like cousins. Um, the CV is going to be your academic history. It's going to have all of your academic accomplishments, a complete list of publications, and highlight all of your research, whereas a resume is going to be a brief one to two page summary of maybe everything that you would have had on a CV. Um, what's hard about the difference between a CV and a resume is that sometimes the words are used interchangeably. A lot, most of the time, people do not know that they're actually two separate documents. And so sometimes they can say it, it'll, they'll use interchangeably, most likely for industry, people are going to be wanting to see a resume versus a CV. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't use a CV as a resume to get a job. It's not a, a one for one. Um, but I would just be kind of aware that they are two different documents and that sometimes the audience um, uh, are, are, is leaning more towards wanting a resume versus a CV. Um, so then when we're thinking about the layout of our resume, um, a lot of what, what's going to happen for modern day job searching is that everything's going to be done online. Um, so we want to have our, we want to take the approach that we're going to uh, have everything focused for an online job search, um, which means that a lot of times your resumes are going to be filtered into um, uh, like read by uh, analytical tools if you're applying into uh, an ATS system, which is the applicant tracking system. Um, so the a couple things to think about with your resume. First is first impressions. Um, so on average, a hiring manager looks at your resume a total of six seconds to decide whether or not they want to continue reading. So we want to make the layout as clean and easy as possible to see our most relevant skills at the top of the resume. We're also going to want to do things like keeping our format really simple, really easy to read, and also really easy to be read by um, computer programs. If we have images, um, it's like really or in colors like it's really popular like to put a little image of a phone next to your phone number because that obviously like looks really good but if you put it into a computer program the computer may not know what that is or how to filter for that and so then it comes out weird on the back end when someone's trying to look at your resume online um and bullet points are always going to be your friend keeping your sentences as short simple and easy to read as possible um you know keeping your i i, ha I have this very controversial opinion that your resume should be about one page for every five to ten years of your work experience. Um, some of my colleagues say that like two pages is, is okay, um, but what you really want to make sure that you do is that the most relevant information that's going to make you qualified for a job is going to be at the top of your resume. Um, and then you also want to make sure, like I said, the most important information is right at the top. Um, We've got a question in the chat. How can you tell if they are leaning more towards a resume when they ask for either? Um, I I would lean towards for an industry position, always going with the resume first. And you can always ask a clarifying question if that's the information that they're looking for. So um, that's, that's what I would do. But yeah, I would always lean towards going with resume first. Thank you. Yeah. Again, and also the hard part about job searching is that it's very uh, selective and uh, it's very person dependent. So you may be applying or hiring with somebody who comes from academia, then that's all they know is a CV and you don't know and you have no idea either. And so sometimes just being aware that knowing that they're two different documents and just asking and just making sure that you're providing them the correct information too. Um. So then thinking a little bit about how to utilize AI in your job search, because um, this is obviously a very hot topic. Um, AI tools can help do a lot of the heavy lifting that you may not, um, that may, that you either may not want to do or that may be preventing you from kind of taking that hurdle or the next steps um, to your job search. Um, so um, things things that um, AI can assist with in terms of looking at resumes and cover letters is doing things like helping with keyword identif ed identifications. So if you have a, a job posting that you're really interested in and you want to apply to it, you can actually copy and paste the job um, the uh, the job posting into an AI tool and ask it to identify keywords, and then you can align your resume to ensure that it has the keywords that they're looking for. Um, we're starting to get kind of into a into a time period where 
companies are utilizing AI tools to help write them job descriptions. And then uh, job seekers are utilizing AI tools to help them align their resume and their application materials to meet the algorithm that the AI tool is creating. Um, so it's a very interesting um, uh, kind of place where AI comes into play, but you can help identify for keywords, content creation. So a lot of the times when you're writing a resume and you have no idea how to start with telling people about yourself or what you should put in a summary statement, these are all things that the AI tools can utilize and help you with. Also, uh, it can do things like read your uh, documents for uh, to proofread for spelling and grammatical errors. Um, and then it can also help with job matching. Um, so a lot of times, like I think sometimes the hardest part about the job search is like, where do I start? What companies are hiring? What kind of jobs am I qualified for? Um, and so asking an AI tool can give you some suggestions. Again, we always have to be a little bit careful because AI tools are just sourcing, especially open AI tools like Gemini and ChatGPT are just sourcing information straight off of the internet. So, but it's always like a really good place to start in terms of like, if you have no idea what you're doing, going to an AI tool, asking it some questions and then kind of starting to uh, build from there. Some other things that you might find helpful with an AI tool. Um, so again, I talked a little bit about helping to identify companies that hire with your skill set. Um, that could also help you figure out who you want to network with or what companies you may be interested in learning more about. Um, I know one of the big things for WISP right now is that they're doing a lot of programming around salary negotiation and um, uh, pay transparency. And so one of the things that you can utilize your um, AI tools to help you with is understanding the salary and wage expectations for a person with your background in specific geographical areas, because not always are you going to be applying for jobs that maybe you're familiar with the cost of living or what the going rate is for that type of a uh, position. Um, so you can utilize salary or AI to help pull salary information. Again, you have to be a little bit careful with salary uh, data from AI tools because they're just, again, pulling it off the internet. So it's not always 100% foolproof. But um, places like Gemini will also give you the links of the places that they're finding the information from so that you can go investigate it further. Um, and then it can also uh, provide, AI tools can also do things like provide sample interview questions. So maybe you've never interviewed for a position before, or you're unsure about what questions should I even be prepared to answer. And um, this is another great place. You can just go straight to the AI, ask them what sample interview questions um, you can put as a hiring manager, what interview questions would you ask somebody applying for job XYZ analytical chemist, for example, and then it'll give you a list of um, examples with example answers as well in terms of what the hiring manager may be looking for out of those types of questions. Um, so it's a really good um, interview uh, practice tool. Um, and then also, again, with the salary analysis, it'll also pull cost of living comparisons as well. So um, uh, if you're unsure about like different locations or if they're wanting to, if the positions would require you to relocate, you would also be able to pull cost of living analysis from one location to another so that you can understand whether or not the salary that you're negotiating for is going to be really competitive. Um, and then again, some cautions with AI. I've touched on it a couple of times. It's just open source. It's from the internet. So you just have to be careful about where your um where the information is coming from. If you're using AI sources to um, help you draft documents like a resume, you do have to be careful that you that you keep it in your own voice. Um I actually just re recently read an article that certain words are being generated by AI tools more and they're becoming more prevalent in written, written documents and publications because of that. And um, so just an interesting, you know, to just to think about what is your voice and would this sentence be said be something that you would say out loud in general conversation? Um, factual inaccuracies. So AI tools have the ability to, they call it hallucination, so they can just make up information um, based on the prompts. So just making sure that you're double checking the information. I think it's a really great place to start from, um, but you certainly want to do your due diligence and making sure that any facts are, are accurate. Um, keyword stuffing, another downside to using AI, especially if you're using it to help you with an application, is that they will um, take the job uh posting and then your resume and they will find the keywords and use it as many times as they can because that's obviously going to increase the likelihood that your resume is filtered through as a high match um, but sometimes the keywords can be used either too much that it just looks ridiculous or they can be used incorrectly and so when you're reading it's not even used correctly in a sentence so you just want to make sure again it all comes back to rereading all of the information 
Um, and it does overlook the, the human uh, um, element as well. So just making sure that the documents are being reviewed by other people. Um, and then privacy protection as well. Just make sure that you wouldn't put anything into an AI tool that you wouldn't want other people knowing about, um, or you wouldn't want broadcasts onto the internet like you're at your home address. Um, and then one other thing just to be weary about when utilizing AI for your job search is that it still has mixed sentiment in industry and in regards to how much people in companies think that job seekers should be using AI. Um, so some people think that obviously AI is a tool that we're all using in our everyday lives. And it's really helpful. And a lot of people think that if you don't have the skills to be able to utilize it or if you don't have some idea about what's behind it, um, that that's a, a missed opportunity for a job skill. And then other people think that it might be a, a, a cheat almost. So, th so there are some programs that will like review your resume and give it scores in terms of how likely it is that it was generated by an AI tool versus a real person. Um, and companies uh, have been utilizing that. Um, I think that's a little bit less common than people really leaning into AI, but it is still very um, new uh, to the job searching process. Um, so some couple tips on how to work with it su successfully, obviously start with a draft. So don't let it, or let it help you start a draft and then take the draft, um, kind of either direction, um, uh, making sure that you're verifying all of the information that you're getting from your AI tools, and then obviously seeking human feedback. So, um, having somebody else re reread it, look over it, um, make sure that it's, um, capturing really everything that you want as part of your, um, job search. And then I am a real human being. So this is kind of where I, um, my bread and butter in terms of the things that I get excited about. So um, I can obviously, I love being involved with the Women in Science program. So if there's any way that I can help you, the QR code is uh, connected to my LinkedIn page. If you want to follow me on LinkedIn, I share a lot of open jobs that we have in the region, um, as well as I'm always happy to connect and uh, help people with their uh, resume review or, or job searching tips and tricks. All right, that's all I have in terms of like prepared slide content. Um, and I know that kind of touched a little bit on everything. Did anybody have any questions or anything that I can help follow up on or or that we could dive more into in terms of um, the job search? Stop sharing my screen. I was wondering if you had any tips for LinkedIn um, job searching with keywords. I I find like sometimes it's hard to find jobs that are looking for like a PhD scientist or like it's hard to differentiate like what education level they're looking for just by putting in like keywords. I was just wondering if you had any like advice surrounding like keywords and LinkedIn job searching. Um, yeah, well, so I think that probably the hardest part about any job search is kind of deciding what types of jobs you're interested in. And so I would probably, especially for academia, I would, and like the education levels, I would really be searching, starting to think about what you want to be doing in terms of your day to day or how you want to apply your academic background. Um, so not always necessarily searching just for PhD level positions, but really what you want to be doing and the type of work that you want to do and kind of start to apply it in your search that way. Um, it'll, it'll open up a lot more opportunities or, or it'll it'll help you find other opportunities and then you can i always i always like to cast a really wide net and then be able to weed it down sometimes if you take your search too narrow then you can't find any jobs so that's how i would uh, take it is just first of all think about